Hey there, gang. I'm back at it with the Senior Gibson guitars. Right now, I'm making some cleats for the back of the J45. What's the purpose of a cleat? Uh, the idea is that it'll help prevent a crack from opening up again. Um, whether it actually does that is sort of a matter of conjecture. And very difficult to prove. Uh, conventional wisdom is that a properly glued crack is at least as strong as the wood that surrounds it. Uh, maybe even more. But in the case of old guitars, um, with cracks that may have been sitting open to the environment for years, you know, absorbing stuff that's been floating down, the quality of the glue joint can be suspect. Now, we do our best to clean out the crack, but there is a chance that atmospheric contamination got in and prevented an optimal bond from happening. So the cleat is kind of added insurance, shall we say. Um, but let's be clear, if the wood is going to crack due to like internal tension or lack of humidity, there's nothing in the world that's going to stop it. It's just going to re-crack. And they don't need to be thick certainly don't need to be thicker than the plate that they're supporting. Uh, these are about 1.5 millimeters, which is about a sixteenth of an inch thick. Sixty thousandths, sixty-five thousandths actually. I knock off the corners just so that they're a bit neater. So the interior of this guitar shows 80 years worth of dirt. And those white spots there are actually polishing compound from when it was buffed at the factory. So we need to clean that surface off if we have any expectation of the cleats staying in place. A little sanding block here with some 220 grit paper on it. Naphtha. Don't light your guitar on fire. Dirty. To aid in positioning these little pieces of mahogany, I have this, which is a dowel with a portion of a push pin stuck in its end, creating what Eric Idle would call a pointed stick. Something you learn to defend yourself against only after having gone through loganberries and bananas. So we harpoon it, put on a generous daub of fish glue. Find its location, stick it down into position, and if I'm working any distance from the sound hole and I want to see what I'm doing, I just use another piece of dowel. Pull that away. Now that glue will actually, um, it's hard to describe, but hide glue and fish glue contract when they cure and pull the two surfaces together. So much in the same way that Spanish guitar makers don't clamp on the tentaones, which they use to attach the top to the sides of a guitar, just put in place there with the glue, it dries and it naturally draws the two parts together. So I don't have to clamp this, um, not for this job anyway. Let dry overnight and there's a neat little line of cleats. Slight jump over the picket fence from Gibson's backyard into Martin's. This will piggyback off of some stuff I talked about recently regarding humidity in the acoustic guitar. People occasionally contend that there should be no reason an acoustic can't be set up with the exact same action height as on an electric. And that is true if the action is on the slightly higher side or if you live in the rainforest. We're going to talk a little about guitars with a through saddle. 
This happens to be a rather nice Martin D28 from the 1950s. I set it up last August after a neck reset. This player likes things on the low side of what we might think of as the standard range. It's about 5 64ths on the bass side, about 4 on the treble. Now that was August, like I said, and it shows back up again in February, showing a spread of 4 64ths on the bass side, 2.5 on the treble, which would be 62 thousandths, 40 thousandths. Uh, 1.5 millimeters, 1 millimeter. So, you know, the string height has gone down about half a millimeter, or 22 thousandths, or 1 and a half 64ths. What does that look like in real life? It's about the width of Liberty's nostril on an 1865 US 3 cent nickel, which is a pretty common unit of measurement. When dealing with low action, half a millimeter is the difference between playable and not playable. Saying that, this guitar was actually not too terribly bad. Um, open position chords were fine. There was some buzzing when you moved up into the center of the fretboard. But remember, Martins, um, they didn't have adjustable truss rods until the mid-80s. On a different instrument, maybe we could just loosen the rod a bit and increase the neck relief. So maybe rather than five thousandths in the winter months, it would live with 10 or 12. But you can't do that here. And it's not like the buzzing was coming from a high fret or something. It was just a general rattle from having strings too low. On an electric guitar, most often that's taken care of by, you know, a patch cord between the guitar and the amp. You don't really hear it all that much. But on acoustic, it becomes part of the sound that is really annoying. So here's where this gets annoying. In order to change the action height on a through saddle, first you've got to unglue it. Yes, traditionally these are glued in place, and there are reasons for that. First being, um, it locks the front and the back of the bridge together with the saddle into one cohesive block. Because without the glue, on these old designs, you really, you sort of, you raise the risk of cracking the front of the bridge off, especially if the saddle is tall. If the saddle gets too high, there's too much forward leverage. Now this can come up to about an eighth of an inch, so I'm going to add a thirty-second of an inch, and it'll be okay. Anything higher than that, you're really, you know, you're risking problems. Which is probably one of the reasons why Martin went to the, um, what we could call the standard or the, well, the blind saddle slot here. Because you've got this material on either end, it acts as a bulwark and keeps the front edge from cracking as much. So to unglue, I first painted a little cold water around the perimeter of the saddle. And these saddles have to fit perfectly, too. Remember, they can't lean or rattle around in the slot. They can't be too tight, either, because, you know, if the bridge shrinks during the winter months, it could crack again. So, not too loose, not too tight. Obviously, I used hide glue or fish glue. So, when it rehydrates for about 20 minutes with the cold water, I can put some heat on it, and it'll come out pretty cleanly. Then i got to let it dry again because, you know, I've made the wood swell by adding water, and I want it to go back to normal before I try to put the new bone in place. Next thing to know about these is, because the slot ends in nothing, uh, in this tapering portion of the wing, you have to work it down to the correct height before you shape the ends of the saddle. Otherwise, those will just disappear, and, you know, you can't sand the bottom of these if you ever want to lower the height, because they get shorter and shorter. There's no material here to sand at the very end, right? So, you know, when adjusting action, it's more normal to file material off of the top of these while it's still glued in place on the bridge. Raising the action? Forget it. You're making a new one. You can't shim these. Well, you know, you can't and then show your face at the convention. People will laugh at you. That's why a blind saddle is far, far more convenient. Action adjustments can be done with shims. You just put them in the bottom of the slot if you don't really care all that much. Or you could make two saddles. One for winter and another for summer. Different heights. Just swap them out with no problem. In this case, I'm trying to make him happy. But the target is going to be continuously moving. So this is set up now in the dead of winter in its driest possible state. Knowing that it's going to rise. Um, it'll probably play great in... April and May, the summertime, it might feel a bit stiff for him. But, you know, it's got to be room to go up without getting so uncomfortable that he's going to want to shave it down again and perpetuate an endless warranty cycle. 
because wood moves and guitars are made of wood. Okay, so this previously had a saddle exposure height. That's the amount of material above the top surface of the bridge of about 3 30 seconds of an inch. And now it is closer to 1 8th, which is, um, that, ga that gained us an extra 64th worth of action, which is what was necessary. And that's pretty much as tall as you want to go on these. Usually you're going to see a saddle of this type in between 1 16th of an inch exposure and 1 8th. And this is about 1 8th. So it'll never need another neck reset and it'll be good for 50 years. But I just got away with it. Now is also a good time to glue down some loose brace ends. Gibson um, didn't really house the ends of their braces in slots in the lining like Martin did. They basically tapered them down to nothing. Uh, they're thinner than your average piece of veneer at the end there, where they go under the uh, curved lining strip. So there's not much to prevent them from just tearing up. Little brace jack. And this is why my forearms look the way they do. I'm cleaning up the squeeze out with some warm water. No, I'm not going to do the whole top. But this place here where there's sort of a rotary motion involved in the scratches uh, I found visually distracting. So I'm just going to use a little bit of this alcohol-based touch-up marker. limit its visual impact. You know, there are thousands of guitars out there that might have a back brace or two that are loose at the ends and people don't even notice. Go for years and years. Um, it's a little different story when we're dealing with top braces, like the end of this X brace. Uh, the analogy is like having a diving board that isn't properly attached to the deck of the pool. You lose the bounce. There's no power. Sooner or later, more of it comes loose, and then you've got serious structural problems. So we got to glue those on. Got to do the ends of the upper transverse or fingerboard brace here. Those are loose as well. All this stuff takes a long time. It's the kind of thing you sort of think, well, I can just pop some glue in those. And No, man, it's like 10, 15 minutes by the time you've got it all figured out, glued up, and then cleaned up. Another thing to be sure of when you're clamping brace ends is don't clamp them too hard <laughs> at first, anyway, without putting some support on the outside of the guitar as well. Otherwise, you could just pop the top right off the lining. Okay, we got to start talking about refinishing the top on this 1946 SJ. Uh, this is something to be avoided, usually, right? Is unless a guitar has been seriously abused by someone with the intent to, like, deface it with a knife or something, playwear usually looks good, and it suits an old guitar. Um, we have no idea what this looked like before the refinishing, but if it just had some strum marks and bare spots and crackled finish, this operation that was done would be considered blasphemy by any guitar collector. You know, it, it's akin to peeling thousand-dollar bills off the guitar. No joke. It's probably worth $5,000 less because someone wanted it to look shiny. Now, we'll comfort ourselves with the knowledge that it was done a long time ago. Maybe the 1970s, judging by the state of the checking and things like the electronics that were put in here. I've got to find a way to clean this up and give it something of a sunburst that will mm, help unify its appearance. You know, it's not to say that it will look original. I can't promise that, but it will be more in keeping with our concept of a 1950s SJ. So I gotta get the adhesive off here and 
get the finish off. Now, I could use the standard chemical paint stripper. I hate doing it though, because, uh, well, it's just, it's such an old guitar. It's got old plastic on it. I don't really know the composition of this finish. I'm assuming it's standard nitrocellulose lacquer, but I suppose it could be some kind of polyvinyl thing too. We don't really know. Um, it's so old that it doesn't even smell. Like oftentimes um, you can get this sort of a, a new lacquer scent when you scrape through it. Uh, so I'm going to scrape some and I'm going to sand some and I'm going to use a rotary palm sander to do that. Which is, oh man, that's brutal. Like, I don't quite know how thin this top was taken. Like, it feels like they were conservative, which is what you want to know. Because, you know, if they had gone really hard at it with 80 grit and stood there for, you know, 15 minutes sanding in one spot, this top could be a millimeter thick, which would be really kind of disastrous. But since it survived long enough for the finish to get old style checking on it, I'm going to assume that, you know, this guitar is in reasonably good shape. So, yeah, I'm going to sand, I'm going to start with like 180 grit, 220 grit, and be really, really cautious, you know. If there is some staining left over, I'm not going to try and you know, get it all the way back down to clean wood. I just want to get the finish off. And then we'll work with what's there. If it ends up with marks and some difference in appearance, well, that's what you get, right? I have my vacuum hooked up to the palm sander and my little homemade air filter going there, but I can't begin to tell you how loud it is to sand an assembled guitar body, even with headphones on. My wife, who was two floors up, said it sounded like the mating calls of a pod of whales. It's so resonant, it's like feedback from a Marshall stack on full. It's really, really loud. So I stopped when I just broke through to bare wood on the majority of the surface. I wasn't going to chase after all the valleys. So I'll get the remainders off with a cabinet scraper here, which is just a sharp, flexible piece of steel with an edge on it that peels off thin little shavings. And I'm not too concerned with the areas that are going to be sprayed dark brown around the perimeter. It's the center I'm after mostly. Then I'll hand sand with 220 grit on a flat block just to even things out. Following that, I'll lightly dampen the surface to raise the grain and sand again after it's dried to knock off any whiskers that rise. The plugs from the pickup controls are glaringly light and I decided to hit them with a dilute solution of potassium permanganate which can be used to oxidize wood. The thing is, the color didn't look like wood that had been under finish for, for 80 years, it was just too orange. So I sanded most of it off and I'll try tinting the area again after the initial finish coats go on. It was a nice try, a bit of an experiment. Looking at the sanded surface, I could see these undulating little lines, and it took a second to recognize that they're the ghosting from the old finish crackle that telegraphed onto the surface of the wood, oxidizing it only in those areas. One light last finished surface sanding, and then I'll pat on several coats of de-waxed shellac to act as a barrier coat or a sealer and give the lacquer something to key onto. That's where we'll stop this week. Next time I promise I'll have at least one of these ready at the end of the video to play. Thanks for watching.